We're here today to show you the steps that we could take to improve the quality and customer service for unemployment. Uh, to start, let's take a look at the gomeen process that we used to identify and remove the waste in the process that we used to help the claimant get their unemployment compensation. At this point in time, we've used the proven process used by Toyota to implement and identify the seven types of waste that the acronym that we use is Tom DeWitt. These are the seven types of waste that we identified over here that are indicated by the yellow stickers and the pink stickers. The seven types of waste are transportation, overproduction, motion, defects, weighting, inventory, and processing. Colorfully demonstrated. Here is the key in case you're wondering as to what the colors are. The teal means input, the pink means delays, the blue means actions, the yellow are waste that we have identified, the orange are concepts, and the purple are the different variations as to what each service center, how they do things. Everybody does seems to do things in different ways. Um, there are three ways in which a claimant can, not I'm going to direct basically from this line here over. This is the process of which it takes to get information to an examiner before the actual adjudication process even begins. Um, a claimant can file three ways for unemployment benefits. They can do it over the phone, they can do it through the internet, and they can do it by paper application. Um, currently, right now, as they are doing it over the phone, they'll call us you know, hey, I need, you know, to, to receive benefits, but there is a wait time. Currently on average, a claimant is on hold for approximately an hour before an interviewer even picks up the phone to help them. Um, once the interviewer builds the claim, identifies that there is a separation issue that it needs to go to an examiner, they re it to us. There is a, on average a wait time of 20 minutes currently before they, before we would pick it up to assist taking the necessary separation forms. Um, through the internet, they file it obviously over the internet, it's pretty quick, simple. Um, there is a delay. It can stay in our system for days before it's even processed. Sometimes between the internet and the paper applications as through it goes through the steps, uh, clerical pulling it, interview, you know, wait time for clerical to get it to an interviewer, for an interviewer to handle it, for it to be rerouted to an examiner, it can take anywhere up to 10 days. The federal guidelines right now, we get 21 days from start to completion to get a decision for potential eligibility for a claimant. So we've already expired approximately half that time before an examiner even gets it. Which obviously, with all the yellows, which are ways that we've identified, some of them would be Duplicate information being received, which can cause rerouting issues, um, forms not being sent correctly, like the correct forms initially, or forms not being completed completely. It's not necessarily done on purpose. It could be an error. Perhaps claimants or employers don't understand everything on the form. That's what we need to address. Um, so to our hopes and dreams, um, with this main process, we hope to eliminate a lot of that uh, because there is definitely a need for improvement. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this off to my colleague, Jason, and he's going to go ahead and take it from the point of when the examiner has the case. Jason, I'm a claims examiner from the Erie Unemployment Compensation Service Center. So from this line here all the way over here is the process that an examiner takes from the time the claim hits their desk until completion. During that process, the examiner has to conduct initial fact-finding with the claimant, initial fact-finding with the employer, utilize rebuttal to clarify any discrepancies in between the fact-finding forms that were taken, and then issue the determination. As you can see, we've identified a lot of waste through that process. Some of the wastes we've identified were delays in getting the information and going through the process. Some of those delays are caused by the global specialization of work that we have across the state right now. This is causing 
inequitable work to be distributed between the service centers that we have and the knowledge of the current examiners to go stale because they're only focusing on one of the many sections of law that we have. Another issue we've identified is duplication of work because as we go through this process, if we have the forms that are incomplete, it causes us to go back to the beginning to restart the process to obtain that information. Now, even when we go through this, because these forms are delayed in the front end, we could get through the process, be ready to issue our determination, get one of those delayed forms that has something different than what we already had, causing us to go all the way back to the beginning, whoops, <laughs> all the way back to the beginning to start the process over again. Now, even once we go through and get to the end and finally issue the determination, we also have the appeal process that could ultimately, depending on the referee's decision, cause the case to come back to the examiner and again, start from the beginning. So as you see, there's a lot of cyclical action here causing us to go back and forth between the different steps. <laughs> now I'm gonna to toss it over to Penny to talk to about the ideal state. I'm a UC Plains examiner and I work in Harrisburg. Um, today I wanna to talk about the ideal state. This is by far the most fun that we had during this process. In the perfect world, where would we be, where would we be? you know, how would our work environment be? And we took a lot of time and we shared a lot of good information and ideas. There's over 30 different topics here or ideas that we came up with but for the sake of time. I'm just going to talk about a few. We know here that we would, in the ideal state, we'd all be doing wonderfully at our job all the time. We'd be able to sit at our desk and do our work and not be interrupted. Um, and it is very important to us, we think about this all the time, how important it is to not only meet the BTQ or the federally uh, mandated standards for us, but to exceed them. So we have that on top of the list here, but I also want to note that meeting those uh, standards does require us to have the time to actually do our work. So in our ideal world, in our ideal state, we would be able to spend more time doing our examining work. Um, in addition to that, or maybe second, I'm not sure, these are both very important to us, 100% customer satisfaction. Who are our customers? They're internal and external. So we do believe that we, in our perfect world, we have great communication we have uh, access to good knowledge and shared knowledge between different bureaus and departments so that we can be in the good, be on the same page. And, and what I'm talking about here is that we're providing the best customer service that we can. So we're already meeting, we're passing everything. This is our ideal state. We are um, dedicated and determined to, to do that. We also want to give that 100% customer service all the time. And we believe that in this new state that we have structured a team that is led by our supervisors and we have great support staff. The support staff, including the clerical, who is, we find very valuable to the work that we do. Um, we um, work hand in hand as a team uh, led by supervisors who provide us that continuous workflow so we're not worried about that. Um, so in this perfect world, in this perfect state, there is no waiting, no confusion. Um, there is no um, delay in the process. And I just want to add to this week has been very enlightening. In this ideal state that we always keep in mind each day as we go in there, what am I wasting? How can I improve? And that we all are on board for that. So um, let me introduce them, uh, Wendy and Mark. Introduced in the future, you can see that there's very little delay in where we're going. We'd like to see warm transfers come in so that we can take ownership of those cases and continue to provide customer service throughout the whole process. 
we would also um, we would emphasize more support, as Mark was saying, and this is what we hope for the future. Thank you. A few things was creating a team structure across the Commonwealth uh, to create a standard process to receive and distribute work across the Commonwealth, uh, train and cross-train to ensure that all the tools and resources are available to the examiners, examine current practices and tools to eliminate the waste, and increase internal and external customer service. With this adjudication process, employers are impacted as well. Stacy and I will be discussing our current metrics and our future metrics in three categories. One will be, and we'll be cutting it down into separating issues and non-separating issues for you. The separating issues are a voluntary quit or a discharge. <laughs> I'm an employment security specialist in the Office of UC Benefits Policy, and apologies, I will be reading. Um, it's Friday, sorry. <laughs> So first of all, on behalf of all the other presenters, um, I wanted to thank you all for coming today. We do appreciate very much the opportunity to present you um, with just a small insight into some of the day-to-day -day challenges that many of our examiners face, um, as well as our ideas for possible solutions. First of all, I want to thank everybody for all your hard work in doing this. <coughs> Obviously very successful. I'd like to know a little bit more in the first two segments here with all the uh, pinks for delays and yellows for waste. Could you get into it a little bit about what the exact waste were that we, that you folks established? Sure, um, so as you can see, a lot of our pink is mm -hmm. the delays, that happens early in the process. Um, when a claimant calls to file an initial claim for unemployment, the call is answered by an interviewer. There's already a long delay between the time when they make the call and when the interviewer answers the call. Um, at that point, the interviewer takes the claim, completes it, builds the claim for the claimant, identifies the issue and reissues the call to an examiner who will then begin the fact finding process. So we see initial uh, additional delay in between when the interview interviewer transfers the call and the examiner receives the call. At that point, ideally, the examiner will be able to commence the fact finding process with the claimant and then um, reach out to the employer, either via fax, email, mail, or hopefully um, telephone call. But between all of those steps, there's a delay. We're waiting to um, get the fact-finding forms back if they need to be sent externally, if we're not able to conduct it by phone. Um, we get the forms back from the employer. We see that there's uh, conflicting information between their statement and the claimant's statement. So then we need to conduct rebuttal. We need to go back to the claimant, present the employer's information, and get the claimant's um, take on that. That may necess necessitate more rebuttal back to the employer again. So the entire fact-finding process um, can take up to two weeks depending on the method of fact finding. Obviously if we're sending our fact finding forms by mail, it's going to take quite a bit longer to receive a response. And we have to um, wait that designated time. Federal regulations require seven days by mail mm -hmm. to give the parties due process and to give them the chance to respond. So depending on how we conduct it, it can take longer. Um, and then when the information is received, finally the examiner weighs the evidence, examines what we have, um, determines credibility. And at that point, usually the process um, speeds up a bit, it, issuing a determination, annotating a claim, wrapping up the um, final pieces, that could take, you know, half an hour, oh. I would say. So, but the, most, the majority of the delay is in the fact-finding process, waiting for things to be returned. If um, if the incorrect fact-finding forms are sent initially, um, the wrong issues being addressed, then we have to start over and get the corrected information. So um, I think that's the trouble that that we're running into most at this point. And that's most of the delays. Yes. Okay. Right, right. How about the waste? Because I see all the other okay. sectors out there. Right. So um, one of the things we're running into a lot right now is fact-finding forms being misdirected to the incorrect office. So employers. Um, not to blame them because who could, but they, um, there's so many addresses and fax numbers and everything in the department to keep track of, right? So they may have an address that they used for a prior employee who filed a claim. They'll send it back to that service center or they'll send it to central office to the employer information center. And so we're waiting to get and the forms. have to try to track that down. Exactly. Okay. We're waiting to get the forms where they need to go to the examiner so they can adjudicate the case. 
Um, other things that the examiners are really experiencing is interruptions. So they're working on a claim, they're trying to get their um, get through the fact-finding documents and make a determination, and they're being interrupted by phone calls. Um, something that we can't usually help if they leave a message for another claimant and you know they get that call back, they obviously want to answer it and get the information, but it does make it difficult for them. And a lot of um, other workflow issues like uh, taking calls, sometimes they'll help out with the interviewers to take general incoming calls if the, um, if the wait time is long. Um, and there are clerical duties that they have to do, matching up fact-finding forms, setting things up, um, things like that, uh, you know, helps to delay the process because it's taking them away from the actual fact-finding and determination writing. Um, I don't know, what, what other big wastes can you, the examiners think of? Well, there was the accessibility to a uniform standard of resources, what resources we have to trickle down to the examiner when policies change. That's a big one. It's a very organic process, as you know, laws are constantly changing, regulations, getting people to understand, so you have to filter everything down. Mm -hmm. If the examiner is unable to get the resources that they need that are timely and current resources which affect BTQ standards, um, and that every office is doing this uniformly, um, we feel by having that standard of research and resource tools available to be it the policy staff, be it their supervisor, that everybody's given the same consistent, almost a branded message back and forth. So it, it is from our one so you're way. you're saying if, if there's a consistent, stable message that would go a long way to help it. Absolutely. We have, or we had, up here, Dixie Cups. <laughs> that was the old telephone system, seriously, that you would tell, how do we do this? Okay, Mary, and Mary passes it on, but by the time it got to Susan, Susan would have a totally different way of doing it. We don't want that. We want a reciprocal system that they can look for themselves. These are updated policies. These are updated procedures that we have. This is the current information. How do I get it? How do I self-serve? If it's self-service, they're in the middle of a claim, they can access it, get the information they need, and then proceed on to completing their task. Okay. Can I interject some things? Sure, yeah. absolutely. Um, as an example, okay, all this is the, up to the interview right. clerical to get out. Okay. As the examiner, with the specialization, I do um, non -sex. My office is non sex but because of the helping of the other office, because they are overburdened with the SEPs and everything, we try to get in with that. But as a non sex office, we are constantly receiving calls. Okay. So when it's transferred from, because non sex <coughs> are one of the major parts that we have compared to uh, the SEPs, but everything is, we get a lot of calls. But in, in this case, as the non seps we get also SEPs, but we're taking eight to 10 phone calls, so when we're working on a set, we have it in front of us, phone call comes in, we have to set it aside. We get that non set call. Those can be done a little bit quicker um, in some cases, but then once we're done with the call, we have to send out the forms, make sure that we have all the issues covered, contact the employer if we need to, mm -hmm. And then we go back, pick up the set form that we was working on 20, 30 minutes ago. Unfortunately, most of the time, we have to go in and review all the work again, because we have to keep changing. All these weights in here, um, we have to give time once we send out the forms. Mm -hmm. If we mail them, we have to wait seven days to get them back. If we call the employer, we have to wait four days on the initial back phone. So these are what the weights are. And then once we get the information back, that's what all these phone calls are here. We review the claim, we have to call the employer back if need be, we call the claimant back, and then we have another 48 hours. Okay, but then in the meantime, with all of this, we're still getting phone calls on top in a continuing basis, and then we have to go back to make sure. So everything is just a repeat process of going back. That's why all of this, is get looped back and forth. And that's where all this waste is coming in because we have to go back, review the paperwork, review everything that we got three or four times just to make sure that we have everything started, properly sent out, properly noted. And then after all these reviewing, that's when we get into entering the determination, if it's possible. Otherwise, as Jason was saying, if we get 
at this point in one of these documents down here, trickle in, it actually says something totally different with what we got. We have to start all over because sometimes we see forms saying that the claimant was discharged from the employer. We get over here, we get another form from the same employer that says, oh no, he quit. Might be the same issue or the union may say, hey, you got to take the claimant back. He quit the same week. So we have to figure out all the which determination is. And that's why a lot of this waste is in here because it takes so long to get some of this up in here and print it out okay. into it. One of the other things I just wanted to touch on was, um, where was it? I don't remember. Anyway, <laughs> um, supervisors. So I, as an examiner, have a question, right? Not all my cases are, are, are crystal clear. <coughs> sure. not, not, it, nothing's cut and dry. So I have a question. Many times because our supervisors are bogged down with other work, sorting mail, tossing you know cases out to mm -hmm. other examiners, all their day workload. Yeah, I mean, all doing all of this, I have to wait in line, I have to bypass certain supervisors because they're busy doing work or they're doing other things, so I have to walk one of the things we talked about was a motion waste. I have the spaghetti of going all the way through the office just to get to Mark's desk on the other side of the world to go, hey, do I have to make this rebuttal? Do I really have to do this? Or, or is this something you think that, you know, maybe I could go without? Or, you know, what do you think about this case? That's one of the biggest things. So what's the solution? Supervisor button. Yeah, that's what we, that's, that's one of the things we thought. Or, um, Supervisor button, instant messaging program on the computer where Skype. maybe I can just, or Skype, where I can just, I need a supervisor. And Mark comes up and goes, what's up, Jason? What's your issue? And, you know, hey, you know, look at this case. This is what I have. What do you think? Okay. I mean, that way I'm not waiting. I'm not walking. I'm not even leaving my desk to get my answer. Also, we have the team concept of the <laughs> collaboration between the examiners. Because right now, if we have a question, we go directly to the supervisor with the so team concept. Words, you may have had an examiner that had a similar situation. Right, so exactly. Gary may have. It's just a matter of right. you two talking to each other. Exactly. Another, and that's all. Right. Right mm -hmm. now gotcha. we are, have to go directly to the supervisor and Perhaps. talk with them. One of the other things we identified was waste within our current metrics because we're hurrying the process through to the end because our current met standard is that each individual examiner has to be 45 to 55, depending on the week. It's an old standard. Um, obviously, our work has changed over the years, but not our standard. So if we want to go far into the team concept, where everybody's a team, the metrics should be reflecting the team because as explained earlier in our implementation future state, you're going to have that person who's sitting there every day just rotating. One's going to be writing, one's going to be taking that phone call directly from the claimant from the interview that one transfer. So it will decrease the delay. So it's a continual process. So it's a team effort. So the metrics will have to be, or be adjusted to meet with the new improvements. I was going to add a concept the concept of a water spider role. Someone who, yes. not, not 30 examiners, but <coughs> going to go and get all this stuff. That waste is put on one person. They deliver, so the examiners stay at their desk examining. And so a person, maybe it's an identified examiner, maybe it's a supervisor, that has to be worked out. But someone is delivering the work to them and taking all the non-valued added time that they do away from them and keeping them in front of their computer working on writing determinations. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay. Yes. How did you guys feel about this process? How did you feel when you walked in, and how do you feel now? I, I came in late. Um, I was replaced. I came in on Wednesday morning, so I had I had some of a clue as to what I was coming into, but I didn't get the first half of the program like everybody else did. But um, I feel really good about the process. Um, I think it's going to make us make our work more, make us more valued to begin with, and also make the process so much easier. 
and we have to, us all here have to promote that out to the service center and make sure they understand what we're trying to do. Yeah, I was kind of surprised of all the, all this weight. I, sitting at my desk, I went through all of this, but I didn't realize that after giving all these ideas, what we could actually resolve just by some of these new ideas, the team concept, bringing some of the stuff back into being able to converse between each other, trying to get a little bit more information so that this person, the supervisor up here, wouldn't be bogged down. Like, if I had a question and somebody else knew it, I'm bogging down the supervisor, taking from what he actually has, has to do just to get an idea because somebody else knew it he could have threw it out there, but I'm waiting on that supervisor. That's all time wasted that we could be actually amongst ourselves. That's when we got the idea of the time, which cuts out a lot of the weight. And along, like he's saying, the water spider, somebody else going to get the uh, paperwork. There's times, you know, I go to the printer four or five times just on one claim. Okay, now, granted, the printer is probably only about 75 feet from me, but four or five times every day for each claim, and you're going right in, you know, anywhere between seven to 10 claims a day, that's a lot of time wasted going back and forth. And that's where that lean future state would come in if somebody could help out getting all that paperwork. And sit, so you have one person doing it instead of 10 people doing it, because 10 people is wasting a lot of time. <coughs> and I'm somebody who's very scientific in my approach, and I honestly thought it was the cult of Shango, and I wasn't hearing anything. But <laughs> 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 I was going nanu, nanu, and I would come out like, nah. But once I saw that the system and the science behind it, and the fact that you can, it is supposed to be replicated, and there is some sort of compliance and enforcement measured in there, and the fact that it's continuing, um, I just didn't want to sit in that box and, you know, we call it something else and we put a big bow, a blue bow on something that's a red bow. Um, and that's not, this really did by the end, I think, I'll say it, I'm a Shingo 8. <laughs> I'll, I'll go to the Shingo model. But the fact that it is a model and it, and it really is legit, that, that is based on reality, um, was very good. And that culture the corporate culture or the culture of the place is in the center of everything. And once we get that dynamic change, I think a lot of this stuff will kind of sort itself out. Coming in from the service center end and from the policy end of it, working in both sides of it and now being a supervisor, it was, it was a good feeling. I mean, at first you came in and everybody was frustrated. You know, you kind of got to get your venting out and, and get that out of the way. But once everybody got down to work, I, it was just amazing to me to see the changes in their faces and, you know, that they're feeling empowered to go ahead and make some changes and it's, it's, it's okay that we can all work together and, you know, I, it was just very uplifting. I just wanted to add it was a welcome opportunity, I think, for us to, to bank, to share, uh, to give ideas that we think are, are crucial. Uh, some of the changes that we would like to see, but um, the process, the mapping was really good, and I think it's, it is definitely a solution. You know, when we keep that mindset all the time, that self-improvement or that continuous improvement, which is what we all want to do, this gives us some clear guidelines and some really good goals working together so that we can achieve that. So it, it provides us an opportunity to have the same goal, to always be on board, to, to make a difference. So I think this is a great vehicle to, to bring that success to, to us. I was happy um, being in this process and being able to talk about the employer's side of things because a lot of times they will mail us everything they have because we are called employer services, and in fact, the adjudication of the examiners need a lot of that really good information, and we're trying to bridge that gap here so that we can get that information to them so that the employer has a fair voice 
and everybody was really open to what I had to say, and I think we have some good ideas going forward on here to <coughs> service the employer as well. In my experience during this process, um, I was frustrated, as Stacy has indicated, <laughs> but more so shocked, I think, because of all of that <coughs> and how each office does so many things differently. Like, my office does this, well, my office does this. Well, we're all doing the same job. We are all trying to provide the same service. So with this process, we came up with a program or an idea to eliminate that. I mean, we're all going to be you know, uniform to get the same result, and that's what we want. Let me ask a different question. How much was the delays and gaps caused by employers not understanding uh, the unemployment process. A lot. Okay. And what is the guy who's got to spend a whole lot of time, who spends a whole lot of time educating employers, what, maybe one of the questions that I have then is, what can I do? What can my staff of six that are out talking to employers on a, weekly and monthly basis do to help you make sure that the employers understand what's going on because when we, when we come to knock on your door that will be the implementation plan <laughs> that you invite us in listen to what we have be part of our conversation um, commit your staff to being part that we can envelop you into our team so that we're not reinventing that's the one thing we learned that that with Gemba and all that is that those simple approaches, there, there is no need for me to feel that I have to, to reinvent something or to show what I know. We have a team, we have people all across the Commonwealth that are resources that you are offering a resource so that when we come knock on your door, it is a line on the um, implementation. We get these calls, matter of fact, I'm dealing with one right now, from employer associations. I'm right now working with a chapter of American Payroll in Allentown that they want us to come and spend, but to give us very limited time, like 45 minutes and talk to us about something, usually. And the two things that usually is, is, there's two topics they're always asking about. Quits, quits and discharges. They see those as the same thing, by the way. You know, it's separation issue. Yeah, and, there's, yeah. and the other issue that they, that they complain the most about is relief and joy. We have, I have a we have. You know, and, that, and that's the thing that they, so, so that, those things I have a task is what I was gonna tell we're him. Constantly, and we're trying to constantly educate, you know, and that, and that we, we spent a good deal of time and we've had to cut that back with, with what happened last November, and we're trying to get back into that. So, you know, one of the things that we're gonna wanna hear from you is, you know, what's missing in, in the presentations we're doing because knowing that we only have 60 minutes. You know, you've got to think in the terms of from the time I stand up and say, hello, I am, to thank you very much, I've got 60 minutes. To reach out to you, at, um, basically as the team concept, is one of our jobs is we've all been assigned tasks. So my task is to get with you to, to get ideas to flow and then working with the team to come up with a plan to better, it's an education process as I'm sure you'll agree. Yeah. We have to come up with a plan to better educate. So my, one of my tasks is I will be getting with you and I will be giving you what we talked about so we can more move forward as a team. You know, not just your unit adjudication, it's, it's, it's about everybody. So the team from the service center, the ideas, and then we'll take it back to the team and, and work it out for implementation. So can, I'll be getting with you yeah. next week, Al. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, we can well, share. Maybe part you may want to wait another week. The person that's going to have to do this is off all next week. I'm well, I can at least lay out the. Yeah, well, and knowing that I'm leading in what is T minus eight weeks to retirement. <laughs> what? Um, we need to, right. I'm not being hard on you. We need to make that happen in such a way that it's going to transition to the new leader. We'll we can together. assure you, though, that your voice and your team's voice will be heard. Absolutely. If our, our, our I'm more project, that Stacey's I'm hearing project. your voice so that we can change whatever we got to do to make what we're doing in the outreach end work a little better because 
if the situation is a standard lack of work, things move for us fairly s swiftly. It's when you guys end up with a mess, you know. And Al, I can commit that Beth and I will personally take you through the new chamber presentation <laughs> we give to employers that describes the whole yeah, life cycle of the plan. You'll be so happy that that T minus <laughs> eight will seem like well, we'll have a look, we'll have a look personal at that. commitment. Now, I wanted to say something. The best thing or the easiest thing to do is tell the employer to read the form, answer the question. Yeah, there is so many forms that we get back that there is like three, four questions to just not yeah. answer. At least put something in there. So that we have something NAA to go off. It's better than nothing. I've told them that more than once. But we'll read the form. can't use it. Can I, yes. can I just might add sometimes, you know, uh, it's cumbersome for them because time is money when it comes to business and employers. But I think we need to take uh, that approach too. It's more user friendly. Instead of maybe sending out five forms, they don't know, maybe reduce that to one or two. The other thing we talked about is giving them access maybe on the internet like we do claimants, so that they have that right from the get-go. They have that first opportunity to send us good information, and I can't, just one last thing I want to add, because we could talk about this a lot. <laughs> this has been great because we see that there's improvement that's necessary, and we are on board to do that. And maybe just one simple thing can make a big difference, and that was the other thing that we saw. So if we gave employers the opportunity to, number one, understand maybe just with a packet going out, like we do with claimants when we talk with them, you're going to get three mailings, you're going to get this, this, and this. Explain a little bit why that's important. How an unanswered question on a, on a form may delay things because it's incomplete. These are things they would probably love to say, now I understand. but. Just to end this, I actually talked to an employer, several, they don't even know what a UC45 is, they don't know how to fill it out, they are clueless. So when we see education is needed, I think uh, we can maybe get them, get good information to them so we get good information back. And I would say if we don't get that good information back, time we were already behind the eight ball. So. Yeah. I had a question you guys described <clears throat> and told us that you found each office was doing things differently. What exactly did you find and were these big variations or slight variations? I can answer that because I help with the DTQ review, so I see the cases that each office produces. Mm -hmm. um, one of the major variations is people using different fact-finding forms. They'll create their own forms um, in some instances or they'll use forms that are not appropriate for a specific issue. Um, a lot of the other issues that people were seeing was workflow procedures. So in some cases, you might get your work from a supervisor who would review it first and distribute it to you. Um, in other cases, it may come straight from an interviewer. Um, even just the way they handle fact-finding. Yeah. So um, in policy, we were under the impression that everyone was reaching out to both parties initially by a phone call to try to speed up the process, and that's not happening. Um, some service centers are choosing to mail their fact-finding forms initially rather than make that first um, attempt by phone. So these are things that um, vary between offices and um, kind of what I was talking about. In the closing about communication, we weren't aware of a lot of these things, and now that we are aware, and hopefully continue, we'll continue to be aware, um, things can be standardized so that everyone has the same opportunities to um, meet the expectations. Mary, do you want to talk a little bit about how the, do you believe the interpretation of law is, is not cohesive in different offices? Um, I actually wouldn't say that, maybe to a small extent. With the fact finding, the rebuttals, that it's how they're doing okay. rebuttals are a little confusing. Some people yes, interpret it one way. and We have yeah. policies and we have procedures. We have laws and we have mm -hmm. regulations. Mm -hmm. Each one is a separate and distinct item. So right. if you confuse a policy with a procedure, it's not that the policies are changing. It's the procedures are different throughout. Thank the you. Center. There's one policy. We have one law. But maybe you don't know that the regulations modify the explain. law or explain a little. But that's our job. So how much bird you know, you we do in this value stream to keep the examiner on target so that there's no stress if they need to reach out to any of the resources, be it 
a law book, a book that explains um, and how do you analyze this particular situation, or it's much more complicated and I need to reach out to, to a specialist in policy or in any of our divisions in federal programs and initial claims and relief from charges to try to get a one-on-one -on -one human interaction um, that we're there to facilitate that. So it, we see it as one holistic um, situation or problem or solution that, that that's how we look at it. It's like, what is it? What do you need? And how quickly, it was, Jason came up with the idea, you know, whoever came up with the idea of the super uh, help button thing, panic button, <laughs> because I'm right in the middle of getting this done and I want to get it done. And, but every time I push it off, I have ways to have an interruption. And it would be nice to see when they are reaching out to policy. I mean, I understand that the supervisors do need to know what their staff are doing, but there's no reason, if I'm an examiner and I have a question, we've certainly got policy staff that are, can answer them, but they, why can't they shoot an email directly and, and make sure that the supervisor is copied on the answer? And that way, policy, if we decide, hey, this is a really good point, we can put it out for everybody. That's correct. Right, so currently we have to get approval from, we do a lot through supervisors before we can actually act. And that leads back to the Dixie Cup telephone <laughs> that we <laughs> refer to as an issue because if I have a question, I gotta go through Mark, who then goes through whoever to then get to Donna, and then she has to reply in the reverse fashion, so by the time it gets to me, it's gone through three people, and... And then he says, that's not well, That doesn't make sense at all. That. Exactly. That wasn't my issue. Um, real quick, Marilyn, you had a question? Yeah, I was just thinking, um, there's times when there's a question on the internet, when the claim is filling out the, um, the initial claim online about severance, mm -hmm. and this is just one example. And it triggers that he's getting the severance and it's higher than the amount, whatever the amount is. Can we have that form in there so we don't have to make that call? That is a very good idea. Um, I'll make a note of that and see if we can get that added. There's other form for you, but to add more forms in there for claiming. Yeah. That would sure. save us. Yeah, so what she's talking about is when they when claimants complete an internet application, we ask them yes or no questions, but we don't ask the follow up questions. So right off the bat, the examiner is already lacking the specific information that they need. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully that's something we can work on <coughs> with the claims unit and see if maybe we can oh. consider adding some more specifics into the internet application as well as have those internet apps saved in the archives so you can retrieve them. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just one question, make sure I'm following the flow correctly. You walk through the phone flow and how you go to the future concept when an issue is detected when it's filed via the phone. Now if an issue would come in via the internet, are you going to follow that same flow over here or is there any differentiation between an issue internet compared to an issue via phone? Where's Wendy? <laughs> uh, yes, um, the phone concept does not change. Okay, When it comes into the internet, over here 80% of our work on both sides is the internet applications. So with the team concept, if we go back to a batch process or do a way, currently we're doing, we work by digits, we do like a third or a half of a digit. If we go back to a batch process that is worked by one of our support teams, then though that 80% is equally distributed throughout the whole site, okay? So then that creates, then this process creates is is just streamlined for that those internet applications or the paper applications or or anything that we would see in that process also um, you know there's nuances with those internet applications coming in but we have with the team concept and then the support staff in there to help us those there's with the internet there, none of that would be. If I could implement some of this to, on Monday in my <laughs> office, it would be done. There would be no if, ands, buts about it. I'm, it's a matter of implementing it and getting it going and seeing how it works and so forth. As far as the internet, in my office, we had an internet team. We would pull them off daily. We wouldn't sit there for days before someone was actually able to work on them. An interview would pull them. They would um, call the employer up 
ask the employer, are you willing to provide the information over the phone? <coughs> if they say yes, they immediately are transferred to an examiner, whatever examiner is available at the time. If they say no, then we would say, are you, can you provide any fax number? We will fax the information. That allows the time to be cut down from seven days for it being mailed out compared to a fax, which is four days. So that cuts that time at least in half. And it saves postage. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. as far as mailing the forms. No so <laughs> that's like what I we said, do. Did not do before, before the litigation because now we just don't have the manpower where everyone's on the phone, everyone it's all done differently. But if we can resort back to that, and that's what we did there in the model concept area, you know, it would definitely improve stats there. You see in the Indiana office <laughs> <laughs> our interviewers. <laughs> When they're off the phone on Wednesdays and Fridays, immediately do the internet. So we're different from the other offices. But that's what I'm saying. We do have they're some staying in there for days before. We right. need, the, my so, be, I'm sorry, go ahead. So what happens here is if they have a fax number, my interviewer faxes it directly to the employer. If there's no fax number and everything's correct, they mail out the form. Because we are constantly getting phone calls. I, I don't get off the phone. Some of these offices, they have like a day on the phone because they're only doing a certain thing on, constantly on the phone because of all the nonsense that come in. And that's where the and, and that's where the that's where the team concept comes in, where we can put have somebody on that team be on the phone one day, everybody else off, or, and then we can, if we need to, we can step somebody else in to answer some additional calls. And that will give the other people time off the phone so that all this and all the interruptions don't happen. And then we can actually go from here where instead of sending the form, we can actually go over here calling the employer and setting it up and saying, hey, would you like to answer the questions over the phone? And then they get transferred to us or let me fax, give me the fax number, I'll fax you the forms. And then that time, 21 days, it's like, oh, 20, oh, 10 days, yeah, I'm done, let's go for it. And that's where the metrics comes in. We'll, we'll be able to match or even exceed the 21 days. And the four, 21 day and 14 day are pretty close in time. And we'll be able to meet those guidelines or even exceed them. What we're hoping with it, with the team structure too is that we'll have a more structured work day. Um, I, what I'd like to see is I can go in and look at my schedule for the day to see what task I should be doing and when I should be doing them. And we're going to be exploring that in the inflammation plan. We have that and we're going to see what how that would work out and where it should work out. Because right now we're kind of we can structure our days, but they're not, it's not bountiful, and there's a lot of, you know, so if we could do that and commit to it, I think we would see better processes also. But to answer, Kurt, your question directly, these two lines with phone call and then the internet, which most of, that's how most of the data, if you look at this, it's how does data come in, and then these were everything else, down to Mr. So these are all the places where you can have um, waste because what if it was um, an employer separation information attached to a request for relief when it should have gone to the service center and not to the employer services? So you squash that down, right? And you get it to the line, because the examiner has to now decide, they have to identify an issue, right? So that's, so now you're kind of vetting and qualifying. If you come up, and when you come up, there's a timeline down here where everybody identified what Bands of time and how do you compress that time? So that's the pink thing down here, and you'll see arrows to show just how complicated the process is. They keep, and that's why everybody's talking about the looping. But it's the nature of the beast, right? You have conflict, you have two parties all the time. So that's what this is down to the appeals process, where it got filtered through the future state. What was the ideal to the elimination of that? where it really becomes back to the most simplest way of doing them. You get that value stream because it's just, what do I need to get it done? I've taken all the distractions away from the examiner. What do you do? Even keeping happiness in there. Not that anybody's tethered to the desk, but what do I need to get my job done? 
I think one important value we didn't add was, and, and it's near and dear to my heart, is I think it's going to cut down the improper payments. <laughs> um, because <coughs> remember we talked about that 70 days, consistently making it through, we get what we call puppies. All right. They did, the acumen did stand for some, but I can't remember what it was. Um, but anyway, we get in where the claimant provides perhaps it's fraud by providing false information. So um, we get a, a, a request for wage and separation for you. We call the UC45 that says it's not a lot of work. The claimant is discharged for misconduct. Currently, because of our backlog of how things flow, those um, I'm hearing sometimes sit for up to what, six months? So by then, the claimant's through the claim. They've all the money's out the door. So by improving this process, it's also going to lower. Hopefully, I, I don't see that it wouldn't, improper payments and it's going to be that problem. Okay, we have time for one more uh, quick question if there's any of the room. I just thought of something else. <clears throat> we also have to think about the language barrier. Yes, we, we, we have. We, have yeah, we've we addressed used, that. <laughs> we had that Spanish team before, which worked wonderfully. Mm -hmm. I was part of it. But because of the furloughs, we know exactly what happened, and right now it's almost we, impossible we with, it, it with, with, the, with, the <laughs> with the offices that we have. We lost two, it's so it, it's almost impossible. So that's another thing that would yeah, delay. Yeah, I can't tell you for sure right now. I can't tell you for sure right now what we'll do. It depends on the um, capabilities of each office and the staffing that they have. But mm -hmm. it is on our list of things to look into and try to come up with an implementation plan to speed along the. Um, claims where there may be a language issue. Yeah? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I got to jump in before you all get out of here. I'm Jerry Alexiak. I'm the acting secretary of LNI. This has uh, been out of for about two months. I've met <laughs> Thank you for, for all that you've done here. I, I've probably learned more in the hour that I've sat here than in any other single hour I've spent uh, in, in the time I've been at l and So I really appreciate the time and effort and talent and professionalism and, and uh, concern and, and uh, you know, thinking about the consumer, the customer at the end that, that's gone into this. What I can tell you from, from my position is that I am 100% committed to this. I think this is a very valuable process. I mean, it, it's it's a you know, it's amazing when you see that how uh, the colors change. <laughs> the, the visual is just perfect. And and to hear, I think somebody said that you know this is something we, we can do this. This is something that we can do. Um, you know, the, the issues here are are some of its uh, you know people, some of its structure, but that that can be adjusted and changed to get here. So I can, I can tell you from the top of, of uh, that's a big building, I think, <laughs> the floor. And when I say the top, I, I don't mean like on the top, I mean the top floor uh, where the, you know, the managers are. I, we really are committed to uh, the deputies. We're, we really are committed to seeing this process through and listening to, to you and incorporating this into how we do business at L&I. So thank you for the time and effort. I know that, that um, you are respected as uh, employees, as union members. You know, Bobby and I have the union background that we bring to this. So I, I have been in the same situation that you have been in, you know, going to administration or supervisors and saying, hey, here's what's going to work. And uh, what mattered as much as the end product was being respected and heard and listened to. And that, that I can guarantee you, will happen. And, and uh, we're going to look not just at ourselves, but at you to make sure we get it. To, to where we are at the end. So thank you for your effort, your time, and uh, I look forward to this process continuing. So thank you all. So I want, want to thank you all for this. This is amazing. Um, you know, we're just so happy to see, oh, I'm Sharon Ward. I'm <laughs> it's, it's so great to see you. This is the, this is the third, the third? third group of your colleagues who've come together and worked on this um, very complex project. Um, when I first came here, I thought that the Department of Human Services, which has 17,000 roughly employees, had the most complicated process. Forget that. <laughs> Forget that. 
Um, you do amazing work, and um, you have a really complicated process, and um, you've got the best elements. You've got managers who listen to you, want to listen to you, and want to implement change, and you've just got a great team of people. So I want to introduce a couple of people who are here to come and visit you. One is Secretary Kurt Topper. He is the uh, Secretary of the Department of General Services. He is leading lean in his agency. Do you want to say, say something? <laughs> I, I just wanted to drop in so that I could be inspired. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, mission accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. We just finished our first year working on lean um, in government, and what I always tell people is that I come from a community organizing background. I went to the Midwest Academy with Heather Booth when I was 19 years old and learned community organizing. It's all about empowering people, and I feel like lean is community organizing. I feel it's empowering people to solve problems and um, creating a problem-solving culture to make things better for the customer. So I also want to introduce you to somebody who, who you might recognize having been through the Lean training. We are very lucky to have with us Jamie Benini. Stand up. Who okay. is here to call your... <laughs> to, to, to have a support... <laughs> it's like go time. No one knows what that means. So they have a production system support. He is he's the person who you saw in the video. The Sandy video who goes around and works with nonprofit organizations and manufacturers and now governments to help um, to spread the word of the Toyota production system. And also a fellow shingwist, I think is <laughs> you want to say anything? Or? Uh, I'll just say one thing. I, uh, this idea of applying the total production system to government, just for your own view, is brand new. Uh, as I was saying earlier, um, so you all are sort of on the frontier of that. Um, these principles are, are a lot of depth in automobile manufacturing. Um, that Toyota's developed over 70 years. They're fairly new to the manufacturing sector. There aren't very many manufacturing companies in North America that do this in any depth and rigor. And it's brand new to government in the healthcare and other sectors. So I really admire your efforts to uh, sort of be trailblazers to figure out um, how to do that. Um, and I'm excited to see how this, this plays out. I think the people that are at the end of this process really care about this. You're talking about people that have had their lives turned upside down and the people you're serving, so it's great work. Thank you for letting me And then we have Shama and Susan, who you know very well. Thank you. Our, our OPS team, who has been here with you, leading, helping to facilitate this. 